Hey everybody, Fletch from All Things Overlanding here. On today's episode of the podcast slash vlog, we're going to be talking about vehicle selection. Um, everything from, you know, what kind of uses you have for the vehicle, uh, what kind of size you're going to need for the vehicle and some of the factors that impact that, and then also what kind of trips you're planning on taking. All of those things are going to impact that decision. So stay tuned to hear more. guys so as i mentioned on today's episode of the podcast slash vlog we're going to be talking about vehicle selection um if you listen to the podcast pretty regularly or if you've watched these vlogs you know already that i'm a nissan guy i'm not going to go way into that um, but i do have a history of that i love my nissans um i currently am using a 2005 nissan xterra se four-wheel drive um so the reason i bring that up is because i'm going to talk a little bit about a few factors that went into my decision to purchase that vehicle and then you know how I arrived at the decision to purchase that vehicle. Um, if you don't have a four-wheel drive vehicle that is a good thing to have for something like overlanding. Um, it's not necessarily required though and and again if you've listened to past episodes you've heard me say you know you could take a Toyota Prius out and go overlanding in that. That is true as long as your trips aren't going to be anything too uh, extreme in the way of terrain. Um, so again, today we're talking about vehicle selection. Um, I'm going to keep my bias out of it, even though if you don't own a vehicle and you're looking for one, I would highly recommend a Nissan because the price is going to be low and also the value and reliability is going to be high. That's the only plug. That's all. That's the only one I'm going to make. All right. So moving on. It could be any maker model that you choose. It could be a Chevy. It could be a Dodge. It could be a Ford. It could be a Nissan, a Honda. You could take a Ridgeline if you want to and go overlanding in it. I've seen people do it. They're fine vehicles, um, super reliable. But so on today's episode, we're going to talk through a bunch of the factors that will influence you on that decision. So again, if you don't already have a vehicle or if you have one and it's working for now, but you know, you're interested in possibly upgrading or looking at a newer vehicle soon, um, these tips should hopefully help you with that. Um, again, before we get started, if you don't already, please subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Um, if you like the episode, click like. If you um, have experience yourself, if you have a vehicle that you use and you think that it's you know uniquely qualified as an overlanding vehicle, please comment um, in the comments below and, and let me know what you're driving and, and what you think of it and how it's worked for you. So um, love to hear from you guys. Just let me know. So let's dive into the first section here, right? So the kind of the first topic that I wanted to talk about is use. Um, and what I mean by use is, is this vehicle going to be an additional vehicle? So do you have another car or truck that you drive every day? And this is just going to be a sort of a toy slash overlanding dedicated vehicle? Or is this going to be your daily driver? Um, and the reason that I bring that up is, you know, one big question that a lot of people don't think about maybe. I myself didn't when I made the decision on the exterior. I mean, I did. I thought about it, but it was gas mileage. Um, I didn't. I just kind of said, you know what? Yeah, I know that the exterior gets 14, 15 miles to the gallon. That's fine. It's fine for me. Um, and I daily that thing for about the last three, three and a half years. And then maybe about five, six months ago, I picked up my Infinity. So I now don't have to daily that every day. And it is pretty nice to have a vehicle that's a little more comfortable and a little bit more um, fuel efficient. But so you want to think about that use, right? If you're going to be driving it every day, it needs to have, you know, enough amenities that you're not going to hate it after a while. So if you're, you know, rocking a stripped out, you know, Jeep Cherokee XJ or something with no interior and, you know, it's just all stripped down, may not be the most comfortable daily. Probably not going to get the best gas mileage either. Um, you know, in my case, that's kind of, as I mentioned, talking about my journey on that, I picked up an 05 Xterra SE, which is like the top trim for the Xterra. Um, mine actually has the Rockford Fosgate 9 speaker system, has a sub under the driver's seat, and then eight other speakers throughout the cab. Um, mine had an aftermarket double den, touchscreen, Bluetooth, DVD uh, head unit in it. So that was kind of a nice thing too. Um, I mean, it's still an Xterra. It's not, you know, it doesn't have leather, doesn't have heated seats or anything like that. I'm not... I'm not a, a glamour, you know, glamping type person, but I, I, you know, when I drive six, seven, eight mile or six, seven, eight hours away to go to a West Virginia or to go to the Trans Wisconsin Adventure Trail or to go to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, 
I'm not going to lie, it's kind of nice to have some niceties, some features, some Bluetooth audio so I can listen to my music and things like that. It makes the trip a little bit more enjoyable. Same with dailying it, right? Driving it every day. It's just kind of nice to have some features with it, right? To have power windows, um, to have heated mirrors, you know, things like that. Definitely not a necessity. So again, do not feel like you have to. And I've rocked cars that were, you know, I, I used to have a 350Z that was all stripped out and just awful. Like super loud, drony, um, super stiff suspension, fully chassis braced, uh, aftermarket brakes, aftermarket flywheel that chattered like crazy. It was, it was not a comfortable car, but I still love driving it every day. So it just kind of depends on what you want, right? But you do want to think about those uses. You want to think about whether you're going to daily it. You want to think about gas mileage and if that's a concern for you. Um, Another thing to think about as far as use goes is towing. Um, you know, mine has a class three hitch on it, which has actually been pretty beneficial. I've been able to pick up some trailers sometimes, um, things like that to use to move stuff, um, rent things from U-Haul and stuff like that. I don't have my own trailer. I'm not, you know, I'm not the type of overlander that drives a vehicle with a trailer towed behind it. Um, but there are a lot of people that do, and it does give you a lot of flexibility. If I had a place to park it, honestly, I would probably be building an overlanding trailer and that would just be where like a rooftop tent would go. That would be where all my stuff would go. And then I would just like park it in the garage garage, unhook it and drive my truck, you know, wherever I want. But it also gives you that base camp flexibility, which I also really like. So think about if you're going to need to tow something with it um, or if it's beneficial for you to do so. Um, so that's another thing. Then four wheel drive or all wheel drive. Again, we're going to get into that a little bit more when we talk about trips because, you know, that can make a big difference. But there's absolutely no reason. I mean, Hoosier National Forest, where I go, there's really nothing challenging in it. If you just want to go out there and camp, you could take a car or front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, anything, two wheel drive, and, and you'd be fine. And if that's all you're ever going to do, if you're just going to go and explore some gravel roads and look for nice spots to take pictures and things like that, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Don't <laughs> Please don't read anything into that. Um, I, most of my trips are to Hoosier National Forest, and they're nothing crazy. I just kind of drive around and admire the scenery, and then I pick a camp spot, and I and I set up camp. Um so, but you want to be thinking about that. Do I need four wheel drive? Do I mind if it's all wheel drive? Like if you pick up a Subaru or something like that, do you want that full control to have four high and four low? Um, or is all wheel drive just fine? Or is two wheel drive just fine? Um, again, we'll get into that more on trips, but um, so that's another thing to think about. Do you need four wheel drive? Um, and then kind of lastly, under the use category here, when you're looking, are you the type of person that just wants a super reliable but stock vehicle and you just want to rely on that? Like, would you buy a Pro 4X um, trim or off-road trim, depending on what year you're looking at, Xterra or Frontier, um, and just kind of let the, the factory make those modifications for you? But then, you know, when you do that, the benefits are that you get something that is going to presumably be more reliable, right? Because it's not been modified or, you know, the engineer's design has not been changed outside of original spec. So, you know, you got to think about that too. Or because in a lot of cases, so when I bought my Xterra, tying back to my experience, I bought a stock one because I got a really good deal on it compared to what I was looking at. I was looking at mostly stock ones anyways, just because they were available. Like I couldn't really find any that were highly modified that were close enough to me that I wanted to look at. Um, so I bought mine stock and then I modified it myself over the last four years. Um, but if you you know know a little bit about vehicles and can kind of check them out mechanically, you could find an Xterra like mine or more heavily modified than mine for probably about the same price as a stock one would be. So again, if you're comfortable with modified vehicles, if you're looking for something, if you're planning to modify it, the cheaper way, honestly, is to buy one that's already modified and then you can continue to customize it for yourself. Um, but I kind of now I look back and I a little bit honestly kind of regret that I bought a stock one because if I could have just been a little more patient and held out, I probably could have found one that already had a lot of the modifications, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of the modifications that I went ahead and ended up doing myself at cost and time and labor, you know, that I had to install all that stuff. I might have been able to find one that was already lifted, already had 33s on it, maybe had some of the armor and bumpers and things like that on it. Would have saved me a ton of time and also saved me a ton of money because when you buy a modified vehicle, especially if you know what you're looking at, you don't necessarily have to pay that much more than what you would for a stock vehicle because parts added to a car actually kind of decrease the value for most people. Um, they're not willing to buy a car that's heavily modified because they assume that something might have been done wrong or it's just hard to know the history of the vehicle. Um, so that kind of caps off use, right? So the next thing that I wanted to talk about was size. Um, and the size of the vehicle 
you know, you need to think about a few factors that will factor into the size that you need. So for example, in the Nissan family, I've got a Frontier, which is the truck with four, you know, you can get a four door in that. And then with the bed, a little bit smaller than the Xterra, obviously, because it doesn't have the rest of the enclosed space. The Xterra is basically the same vehicle, but with the SUV back on it. Um, and I have two kids and a wife. So that's why I was kind of like, the, the best way to do this for me would be the Xterra. Plus, this is just a thing that's sort of unique to uh, Nissans. The Frontier, in almost every case, is three to $5,000 more for a similar you know, year make or year trim um, and mileage Frontier. So when I was looking at my Xterra, I looked at Frontiers and they were all about three, four grand more than my Xterra was with about the same miles and the same trim. Um, so in that case, it made more sense for the SUV because of my family, and it also made more sense just from a price standpoint. I didn't want to pay extra just to have the, the truck bed because I didn't need it. Um, so as far as size goes, too, so family is, you know, one sort of thing, or friends. If you're taking a lot of friends, if you have dogs, there's, you know, a lot of folks that I know that bring, like, a couple big dogs with them. If you need that interior space, then you want to think about that when you're thinking about the size of your overlanding rig. Um, another one is your sleeping arrangements. Are you going to be sleeping in a tent? Do you want something that will go on a rooftop tent? Or are you going to be sleeping in the vehicle? Because there are a lot of folks that will build bed platforms inside of their vehicles, even in Xterra's, I've seen it before. Um, so if you plan on sleeping in the vehicle, then you definitely want to think about size. Like, so again, there was Frontier, then there was Xterra, and then I could go with an Armada, right? The big eight seater, 5.6 liter V8, full size SUV. Um, for my case, you know, that thing was, is, it's awesome, but there's less modifications available than the Xterra. It's a bigger rig, so getting it in and out of stuff, you know, I do like to go off-roading occasionally. Um, just like to an off-road park, but then I also like really tough terrain overlanding type stuff too. Um, so just for, with the modifications and stuff like that, I, I was like, you know what, the Xterra is the most rugged one that I can get. It's also the cheapest, you know, you, you jump up in price when you go to that full size, you, you decrease your gas mileage when you go to the 5.6 liter V8. So those were all things that I had to think about. Um, and then as far as size goes too, you want to think about stuff. So if you don't have a family or if you don't have dogs, um, what kind of camping do you do? Are you like a backpacker style where you have everything in a backpack plus a, you know, a tent and that's it? Or are you the type that is going to bring, you know, like I have the full drawer system now in the back and I've got cooking stuff and, you know, a double burner stove and all that stuff that I want to bring with me. Um, cooler, um, big water jug you know, chainsaw, like I've, I've got a ton of stuff, right? I'm a gear guy, so I bring a ton of gear. Um, are you that type of person? Do you need a lot of room for your stuff? Because you want to think about that as well. And then sort of the last thing, and, and I hadn't really thought about throwing this in because I've always been a used car person, um, especially for something like overlanding slash off-roading, because I would feel if I bought a $60,000 brand new truck and went out and tapped a tree with it, I would be pissed. Um, so, but you know, a lot of folks that I've seen, especially nowadays in the overlanding trend are picking up like new diesel Colorados, you know, Chevy Colorados or, um, you know, newer, you know, like the gladiators, people are picking up a lot of gladiators and then instantly taking them off-roading or, or overlanding and things like that. So you want to think about, do I need a new vehicle or do I need a used vehicle? With the new, you get warranty, you get, you know, the fact that it's new, so you don't have to worry about maintenance or anything like that. Did the last person take care of it? Um, but with used, you know, then you're saving all that money that you may have spent on the new one. And again, that heartache, right? If you happen to tap a tree or slide down somewhere that you shouldn't or scratch, you know, branches down the side of your vehicle, if it's brand new, that hurts a lot more than if it's, you know, a 10 year old used vehicle. Um, so that, that can impact the size too, because again, you might be able to buy a small new truck for 30,000, or you could buy a used, you know, full size Armada and put all the modifications on it for 30,000. Right? Um, so you want to think about that too, when it comes to size. So that kind of caps off size. All right. So for the final part here, um, trips, this is probably one of the larger influences on what kind of vehicle you end up picking. Um, so for example, if, if you're somewhere where there isn't anything nearby for you to get to, and you have to drive hours and hours and hours to get to a location to do overlanding, let's say, right? So I'm in Indiana, so I actually don't have a ton of stuff super close to me, but I can go to Hoosier National Forest within an hour and a half or two. Um, so I'm not complaining, it's not too bad. 
But, you know, a lot of my trips have been West Virginia, about eight, nine hours. Um, Trans-Wisconsin Adventure Trail, four to five, six hours, somewhere in that ballpark. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan, six to eight hours, you know, that kind of stuff. So, again, if you're going to be driving super long distances and things like that, um, it may actually be in your best interest to pick up something like, you know, a four-cylinder Subaru Crosstrek or something like that that has enough ground clearance that you can get through most things. Um, but that would be fine for gravel roads, but can still get, you know, mid to high 20s, low 30s on the highway. Um, sometimes I wish I had something like that because of the distance that I've taken on some of these trips. Now, of course, when I get to, you know, like West Virginia, for example, when I got to West Virginia, um, there were some big rocky, you know, water crossings that we did and things like that. In that case, I was glad to have, you know, the big meaty tires and lots of ground clearance and armor underneath of it and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, honestly, we were there for about four days. And that probably accounted for half an hour total worth of the driving than the 10 to 12 hours a day that we did in four days. Maybe maybe a half an hour I needed, you know, that ground clearance and those big tires and that armor. So if you think about that and you just say, okay, well, I'm not going to do the crazy stuff. I'm not going to go out and, and go through these big water crossings or do rock climbing, you know, that sort of stuff, these crazy trails. But I want to go and explore some semi-challenging trails. You could probably do that in a smaller, more fuel-efficient vehicle. Um, I actually know a guy that, that has had an Xterra for a long time, and, and he recently made that exact decision, right, to, like, switch to a Subaru because he gets a lot better gas mileage with it. Um, it's newer because his Xterra was around the same age as mine, so it was an upgrade for him from a reliability standpoint, a mileage standpoint. Um, so, you know, that's definitely something you want to think about. Um, as far as your trips go too, you want to think about how long are your trips, right? So one of the tougher things is if you get something smaller like a small Subaru or an Impreza or a, you know something like that, um, is you're not going to have as much room for stuff. So if you are into like week long, two week long trips, you know a larger vehicle may be better. There are options. You can get you know things for the roof of your vehicle. You can get things for a hitch for the vehicle to add more storage, but they're still limited. I mean, there's only so much you can do from a space standpoint. So you need to think about what your trips are and how long they're going to be and what kind of stuff you're going to need to take with you on those trips based on that length. Um, and then kind of the last thing is when you're talking about trips and you're out in the middle of nowhere, so you, you, know, you drive hours and hours away from your house, if something were to happen um, to your vehicle, is it a vehicle that is common enough that you could, you know, in West Virginia, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, could you find a dealership or some sort of place that may stock the parts that you need if you don't have them on you when you take the trip? So that kind of ties into reliability a little bit. Um, it's a little different than reliability. It's more like readiness of parts. So like, you know, old school Range Rover Defenders are cool. But if you have one of those things and you're in the Upper Peninsula and it's 60 years old or whatever and it breaks down, can you find a new drive shaft for that thing? Can you find a lower control arm, an upper control arm, a, you know, whatever breaks, a U-joint? Can you find any of that stuff um, in a pinch if you are in the middle of nowhere? So you want to kind of think about that too. Think about your trips. Think about where they take you. Again, if you're staying really close to home, and you don't have a family and you're not too into gear, you could go with a smaller SUV, you could go with a pickup truck like a Tacoma or a Frontier um, really easily and make that work. If you're going super long distances and mostly not super challenging rocky type stuff but more gravel road type stuff, you could go with like a Subaru, you know, Crosstrek or Forester or something like that that will give you good gas mileage, nice comfort and amenities, um, be reliable, but still have all wheel drive in case it's snowed or in case you get into some sloppy stuff. Um, so that could work for you then too. And then if you have like a big family or if you have a, you know, two kids and a big dog or three dogs or whatever it looks like, and you have to tow a lot, then you might want to go for something like a full size, like a big full size quad cab, you know, power wagon or f-150 or you know your nissan armadas those sort of things that give you more room or if you're sleeping in the vehicle a lot and you just want that extra space for gear and yourself to be able to sleep and build a platform in there then a full size might be a good option for you there so that's kind of the summary hopefully that kind of wraps it up for you guys um again wanted to keep it around 20 minutes like always so if you made it this far, you made it to the end. Thank you again. You guys are awesome. I love you. Um, so yeah, that pretty much wraps up this episode. Um, hope you enjoyed it. 
Um, if you have any questions, like I mentioned, or if you have any feedback or, you know, kind of, I would love to just even hear about, you know, in the comments, hey, I picked this vehicle and here's why, or hey, I picked this vehicle and it really works because of this, or I picked this vehicle and it doesn't work because of that. Um, please comment down below. Tell me about your experience. Tell me about your vehicle. If you have a two-door JK or two-door, uh, you know, TJ or something like that, and it's way too small, but you made it work and here's how, that would be really cool to hear too. So yeah, I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, thanks again for watching or listening on the podcast. Um, hopefully you guys had a great week and uh, I'll be back next week so thanks again have a good one talk to you soon